But let's open our Bibles to chapter 8 of Revelation. As we turn there, Revelation 8 introduces another doctrine. Remember I told you that the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ, and it's filled with incredible doctrinal insights that aren't as clearly and powerfully communicated anywhere else in the Bible. That's, that's why this book, as I've said many times, was the most preached from book in the early church. It was the only book that as they've excavated and tabulated and codified every early message from the, uh, what we would call the era of the church fathers, the post-apostolic church, from John's period onward, from 100 AD or 96 onward, when they got those earliest sermons and they've, they've translated them and, and analyzed them, only the book of Revelation has every word of it quoted in their sermons. Now, they quote a lot from Romans and Luke and John and everywhere else, but the early church seemed to have either requested or desired or whatever this book to be taught. And this is one of the reasons why. Look at chapter 8. Chapter 8 is a question to us. Why does God send the second greatest ecological disaster of history in Revelation 8? Why does he do that? And the answer is clear. And it's all the way through amplified in this book. It's because he, that's the God who sends this disaster, is a just and loving Savior. Now, the doctrine of God as Savior is not one that we think about very often. We think of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. But before Jesus Christ was incarnated as God the Son, our Savior, God the Father revealed himself in the Old Testament as God, a Savior like no others. So God himself is a Savior. And this chapter shows God sitting on the throne as the loving Savior who is so just he can't overlook sin. And that doctrine is wonderful to let it get kind of uh, deeply placed in our minds and set as you read this book. But starting out in Genesis 6 through 8, God sent the first disaster to our ecology. It was the first one in human history. It was the catastrophic global flood of Noah. Now that's what the Bible says. The Bible says that during the time of Noah in Genesis 6 through 8, God flooded the entire earth. And that to emphasize what he meant, he says it was higher than every mountain and that all living creatures, not the ones that were living around Mount Ararat, but every living, breathing land animal on earth was destroyed in this flood and every human too, other than those that were on the ark. And it was less than 5,000 years ago when God completely devastated the surface of the entire planet. Now remember, scientific facts are scientific facts. We don't dispute any scientific facts. What we do dispute is what frame you interpret them through. The frame I choose, and I trust many or most of you do, is looking at scientific facts, the very same scientific facts everybody in the world has ever discovered and recorded. But do you look at them through the framework of the God of the universe who created everything, who explains how he created it, and who tells us his purpose, which is through the Bible, Or do you interpret those facts through the eyes of people that deny there's a creator, deny that there is an ultimate God for whom they are going to have to someday give an account to? Whose set of frames do you put the facts within? That's really the essence of the debate. I choose to let all facts that have been discovered be framed by the Bible. But many believers, for whatever reason, maybe they think it'll help them witness better, say, well, we can't really trust God's frame, so why don't you secular, evolutionary, primordial slime creeper-outers of the soup of the evolutionary whatever, why don't you tell us how it happened? And they've already stated that they don't believe it and they deny it, but once in a while, they agree. And when I was out having breakfast in Los Angeles at the Shepherds Conference a while back, The LA Times was there, and I looked at it, and the the front page said that scientists have found remnants of a one-mile-high wall of ice that was towering over the Los Angeles basin less than 5,000 years ago. And I went, wow. They got in the frame, that one. Most, they never get in. God said less than 5,000 years ago, 
The aftermath of this flood was what we call the global ice age. Well, how did it happen? Through 40 days of rain, plus most likely what God calls the fountains of the deep. That's how God describes volcanoes. Fountains, that means something spewing out of them that come from the deep. Now that is a very good description of a volcano, that the molten material is beneath it in the deep and that it fountains out of the volcano. But through 40 days of rain and all this volcanism, Every square inch of this planet was devastated. God drowned every land animal, every human except the eight in the ark. So we would call that the first catastrophic ecological or ecological disaster to ever hit this planet. God flooded and uprooted, floated, rotted, or buried every plant and tree on the surface of the earth. He muddied every drop of water, probably kept the sunshine from being seen for an entire 40-day period. Now, the event in Revelation 8, he only does that to a third, a third, a third, a third of the sun, of the water, of the, the sea creatures, of the land creatures. He only does thirds. Back then, everything there has never been anything like the flood of Noah that buried, flooded, and changed every inch of the earth just under 5,000 years ago. That is until the events of Revelation 8, which are yet future. The Revelation 8 event, though, has a different purpose. God said, I'm through with that generation, and he killed every human except for eight. In the tribulation, God says, I'm not through. And all the way through, a loving and just God has his arms out. And more people, the Bible says, if you use this framework, God's, more people are saved during the tribulation than any other single time period in history because of a loving God with his arms out. So as we open to Revelation 8 again, we've already seen this, that, that Revelation 8 contains what we call doctrines of a loving God. The word doctrine, didache, means teachings. What does the Bible teach about the God of love? Well, we saw basically there are seven in this chapter, and we're going to finish them up today. Last week we saw the first three, the doctrine of inspiration. God designed Revelation to connect everything. God connects what he started and his promises at the fall and uh, the entrance of sin into the world back in Genesis. He shows the end of that and the promise of salvation he shows the ending of that he connects the rest of the bible secondly god designed prayer as our vital connection it's kind of like nowadays everyone says oh make sure you're charged your cell phone before you leave god says make sure you're engaging in prayer before you do anything see we kind of have a you know with our obsession to be in touch and you know never out of touch with our technology of phones it's a really kind of a primitive picture of the incredible technology of being in touch with God and prayer is our vital connection in fact prayer monitors the health of our souls by how much we need the Lord thirdly we saw the doctrine of sovereignty how God weaves and connects our prayers to his plan remember he he answers them yes or no or wait and the waits he he holds Prayers, especially ones that are imprecatory or for justice and for, you know, God to, to avenge a wrong, he holds those until his perfect time. And that was explained and we looked at that. Then these next four are the trumpets. We're going to look at them this morning. The doctrine, God is the only giver and sustainer of life. Secondly, in verses 8 and 9, God holds our life's breath and even our ability to breathe in this world. We don't continue to exist except at God's allowance. And, and he shows us that. And God exclusively controls the water of life. And uh, he says that he's the source of it. And finally, he's the source of the light of life. So l let's just look at the doctrine of God as love. Because I, I think that uh, many people in the Old Testament and in Revelation have a little trouble with this. They say, how can a loving God incinerate all those people at Sodom and Gomorrah? And how can a loving God destroy or have Israel destroy all the Canaanites? How? Well, you have to understand the, the never-ending perfect connection between God as love and God's justice. See, he is perfectly loving and perfectly just. And there, there is no one else apart from God who can be perfectly loving and perfectly just. Either we're over hard on the justice side or we're overemphasizing the love side and excusing everything. God is perfect. So 
God is eternally and forever revealed as possessing the attribute of love, as it says in 1 John 4, 8, and many other places, God is love. Yet the same God of love that created the world flooded the world. And there's no incongruity between those. The same God of love that created the world flooded the world and destroyed every air-breathing land animal and human that wasn't in the ark. But that's a God of love. His love never wanes, and neither does that other attribute of his, which is his justice. See, he keeps them perfectly balanced. And, and that's, that's the beauty of our God. The same just God that founded the, this planet by his creation, flooded this planet, also left Noah as a preacher of righteousness. 2 Peter 2.5 tells us that. The whole time Noah was preparing the ark, God was having him preach righteousness to anybody that would listen. That's God as a savior reaching out to the world. So to really comprehend the events of Revelation 8, we need to understand, secondly, not only is God love, God is a savior. God introduces himself as, I'm a God of love, who am characterized as a savior. And the reason Jesus Christ is such a wonderful savior to us is that God the Son reflects and reveals God the Father as a savior. And and that concept, sometimes we need to dust up a little bit. In the Old Testament, God first revealed himself as a savior when he went looking for fallen Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. Who was looking for whom? God was looking for Adam and Eve hiding because they were so aware of their sin. God came looking for them. That's what a Savior does. In the New Testament, Jesus said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save what? The lost. See, God is a Savior, and he comes seeking. Well, after he went looking for them, God as a Savior made a way for their sins to be covered through shed blood. That's Genesis 3.21. God killed two innocent animals, skinned two innocent animals, and placed those skins of animals who shed their blood on top of Adam and Eve as a covering, as a perpetual picture of him covering their sins, not taking them away until the cross, but covering them mercifully covering them. And then he promised in Genesis 3.15 that he was coming as one who would crush, uh, be crushed on the cross for sinners. That's the first mention of the gospel in Genesis 3.15. Well, God is further revealed, if you look in the Old Testament, in Isaiah. Now, Isaiah is called the fifth gospel because it has all, all the, the coming of Christ, the forerunner, John the Baptist, and Christ the suffering servant, and even his crucifixion account. And we all know that in 52 and 53. But before that, look, look at the promise. Isaiah 43, 11. I, even I, am the Lord. Beside me, there is no Savior. He said, if you're looking for anybody else to save you, don't look. There isn't anybody. I'm the only one. But I love Isaiah 45. Tell and bring forth your case. Let them take counsel together. Who declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I the Lord. Now this is, we've looked at this many times, this is God's calling card. He's the only one that knows the future. He's the only one that can write prophecy. He's the only one that can not only give us a framework to understand everything past, he can give us a map to understand the future. Only the Bible has prophecy. No other religious book in the world of the major religions has prophecy prophecy. And that's what this is talking about. But he doesn't end there. Look at the end of verse 21. And there's no other God beside me. And look at his self-description. A just God and a Savior. Do you see that love, the loving Savior, and a just God merged into one? And he says, there's none besides me. Then in the New Testament, we see God, our Savior, in action. This Old Testament God, who is a Savior, sends Christ, his only begotten Son. He allows Christ to die as a substitute, just what he promised in the Garden of Eden, that that Jesus would, would be bruised by the serpent, but in the process would crush the serpent's head. And that message of the substitute of Christ, his substitutionary atonement on the cross, then God raises him, seats him at his right hand, and sends out his apostles. And what do they say? Well, here are a couple more verses. These are beautiful verses about God as Savior. 
And we need to realize that to understand the book of Revelation, remember that the one that is pouring out all of these, uh, unfurling the seals, blowing the trumpets, and pouring out the bowls of wrath is a Savior. And he has a reason to do this. And this is what Paul said, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Now what does this loving just God want? Verse 4. Who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth? That is what you see all the way through Revelation. That is what we're going to trace. When God is pulling out the stops, shaking every inch of the earth, at the same time, he's deploying the greatest single missionary force ever assembled, 144,000. He is sending out two witnesses that testify of who he is and then as everything is falling apart and just like everything is crumbling before people's eyes he sends an angel in low earth orbit loudly preaching the gospel why because god desire god our savior desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth and titus reinforces that when the kindness and the love of god our savior see that that essential description of God. Well, Revelation portrays our God of love all the way through. Starting, in, if you just are in Revelation, look at chapter 7, the first eight verses. God deploys his 144,000 evangelist servants. Do you remember, Jesus promised on earth in Matthew 24, 14, that the gospel is going to go everywhere on the planet. And every generation is in charge of taking the gospel into all the world. But when God does it, he doesn't just do it online with radio and print or showing videos. He sends out 144,000 sealed, what we would say invulnerable, they cannot be destroyed people. The, the beast, the devil, and the demons can't touch them. And they personally do a soul-winning conversation with people. And when he does that, look what happens in chapter 7, verse 9. After these things, look at the proximity. He deploys the 144,000 Jewish missionary evangelists. And after these things, verse 9, behold, a great multitude which no one could number. So what's the net result of the God who sends? Well, up on the slide, you see it. God the Savior saves a countless multitude out of the holocaust of the tribulation. And what, what people does he save? No one can number them of all nations, all tribes, all peoples, all tongues. They stand before the throne, before the Lamb. They're clothed with white robes. They have palm branches in their hands, and they're testifying of their great God. This, the proximity of the deployment and this crowd, communicates the fact that there is success, that there is a countless multitude that responds to the gospel. And it doesn't end there. God sends the two witnesses in chapter 11. Uh, if you turn over to chapter 14, uh, we see the, the recall of the 144,000. I don't know if it's halftime or if they're done, but they're standing with the Lamb in chapter 14, verse 1. On Mount Zion, commentators differ whether it's earthly Zion and they're having a meeting in Jerusalem and he's resending them out, or if it's heavenly Zion, they're in heaven. But they're together, the 144,000. But when they're standing there together and, and rejoicing in what the Lord has done, look what the Lord does in chapter 14, verse 6. That's the next point up there. God the Savior, who sent the 144,000, who saved countless multitudes through them, who sends the two witnesses to crisscross and testify of him, now sends an angel preaching the everlasting gospel. Now look what's so interesting about the gospel in verse 6. Another angel flying in the midst of heaven. Now, the midst of heaven is how you describe the sun in mid-heaven. Uh, kind of like noonday sun. It's kind of like you can't avoid it. It's right there, right overhead, blazing down. That's like this, this low orbit angel. So he's up there uh, circling the earth where everybody can see him no matter where they are. And look what it says. His commission from God is he has the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, and what is his course as he flies around? He goes to every nation, to every tribe, to every tongue, to every people. God is a Savior. God 
is wanting to seek and save the lost. God has his arms stretched out during the horrors of all the plagues, of all the, the judgments of the tribulation. He's not sitting up there uh, enjoying the demise of these helpless creatures. They have nowhere to go, kind of like scampering around when you throw a log in a fire filled with termites and they come out to perish. He rather is up there, arms out, and saving countless multitudes. See, that's the perspective we need to understand in the tribulation. But look at the gospel, the everlasting gospel. If I was doing a paper on the everlasting gospel and didn't have verse 6 and 7, I would not include these elements. Look what it says. Saying with a loud voice, here's God preaching the gospel through this angel, fear God. Now that's good, it resonates. The last two verses of Ecclesiastes, fear God and keep his commandments. It's the whole duty of man. Okay, fear God. God, give glory to him. And God is glorified when we confess we're sinners, when we confess we're lost. So that's good. Yep, tracking, that's in the Bible. But look at this next part. For the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him. Now look at, at the, fin the finale, the final version of the creation account. You know, there's a whole bunch of well-meaning Christians that think that God kind of made a big warehouse and allowed evolutionary processes to assemble them. In fact, I read a lot of those this week, reading about these seals. Uh, and I was reading about how scientists are looking at global warming. You know what they say? That the earth invented. That's the actual, I mean, university of this and university of that. The jargon they use, the earth invented the photosynthetic process. Really? The earth invented that. That is astounding that, that matter spontaneously can intellectually come up with one of the most complex phytoplankton photosynthetic factory and it invents it. But we couldn't think God did it because God is out. Never he can't do it. Somebody else or something else. But look, God says, no, no. The only way you can be saved is to believe that I made Worship the one who made heaven, who made the earth. He didn't allow it to evolve. He actually made it. It's, it's, I mean, I can go to the store and I can buy a bunch of material and I can throw it on the counter, but I can't say that I made breakfast unless I actually do. See, we have to understand that, that you must frame the facts either with the godless view or with the creator himself's frame, which he gives us. And here it is. He made the heavens. He made the earth. He made the sea. It did not percolate from the third most common element in the universe, you know, oxygen, with the number one most common element, hydro hydrogen, and they got together and made something, you know, and they made water. No. He says, I made it. I made the seas and all the intricacies of the plankton and the currents and everything else. And he, look what else he says. I made the springs of water. That's the hydrological cycle. And that is really, really uh, far past billions of years ago. It was really recent that even scientists say the whole hydrological cycle we see today happened. God says, I made all that. That's the gospel that he proclaims. And he preaches it, and by the way, many, many respond. Why? Because God wants humans to repent. Look at chapter 9. As long as you're in 14, back up to 9. I want to show you something that's very interesting. To best understand those seals, those trumpets, and those bowls of judgment, look at the reason God sent all of them. He tells us what it is. It's, it's in chapter 9. But the rest of mankind who weren't killed by the plagues, we've gone through seven seals and now seven trumpets, did not repent. You say, how do you know that? God told us that. Look at verse 21. And they did not repent. What were they doing? They were still worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood which can't see nor hear nor walk. Anything but God is what the mantra of the tribulation of humanity. But 
Why does God send us that little insight right in front of you in chapter 9, verse 21? Who but God would be keeping the score of how many are believing and repenting and how many are not? Only he would know that. Everything's falling apart. There, there is just, I mean, it's just the whole world is crumbling and all this horrible stuff is happening, but God is watching. He's saying, oh, we've got some repentance over there. No repentance over there. We've got repentance here. No repentance over there. Why does God send that insight? that only he could know, because God is a savior. He has already told us something. He is not willing that any should perish. God wants humans to repent. Now watch with me as the God of love and justice, perfectly balanced and changeless. See, his love and his justice are perfectly balanced and unchanging. He justly loves the inhabitants of the earth. And as a just God, he sends them loud trumpet blasts of warning. They're not silent. It's not oblique. Loudly, everybody on earth can hear what God is doing, whatever he does. Whether he sends 144 or he sends the angel, loudly. But as he sends those loud trumpet blasts of warning, as the loving God, and this is the picture, When you read Revelation, you should see in front of the exploding, burning, dying planet, you should see the just God that sent all that and the loving God who has his arms open. You see, while you hear his voice, he says, don't harden your hearts, Hebrews chapter 2. Don't harden your heart. Repent. Well, let's go through them. The doctrine of sovereignty tells us this. God connects our prayers to his plan. And in verses 5 and 6, all the prayers for judgment, God is perfectly in his timing. All the prayers for people, for vengeance, for justice, for God to do something about what the injustices are that we see in Revelation 8, 5 and 6, we see God's answer. And verse 6 says, the seven angels who have the seven trumpets prepare themselves to sound. Now there's, uh, there's an amazing parallel if you take the time, remember I told you it connects the whole Bible, between Exodus 7 through 12 and the plagues in Revelation, the the trumpets and the bowls. In the book of Exodus, we have a group of people that worshiped everything but the true God, and they believed that the false gods ran everything, and so Moses comes and confronts those. In Revelation, we have the very same thing. We have a group of people that have already said anything but God, And we're going to take natural processes and evolution and everything else. And we're not going to believe in a creator. We're not going to worship him. We're not going to see his image. And we're going to believe that we have had no origin from him. And we have no no destiny with him. Especially with him as judge. And to those two groups, God intersects. And basically... The, the choice is turn to the only living and true God. That's what the Egyptians had to face. That's what the tribulation earth dwellers have to face. It's a choice. And taken together, the trumpets of Revelation 8 and 9 and the bold judgments of Revelation 16 reflect the plagues of Egypt in Exodus 7 through 12. And the Egyptian plagues were orchestrated by Moses. Moses didn't do them. He orchestrated them. God did them. Moses was the instrument. But basically, they had two similar purposes. Number one, both groups, the Egyptians and the tribulation earth dwellers, needed to know there's only one living and true God, not many. Now, isn't it amazing that recently our newest pope said you don't even have to believe in God? to be saved. It's a journey and just God sees your heart and if you're believing in the wrong one, he'll still take you. And by the way, you know, if you're homosexual and never repent of it, he'll take you. This Pope has said more controversial stuff in a few short months. I mean, he's even talking about letting the clergy get married. I, I mean, he's, and, and he's winning the world. I mean, you give a gospel where you say, you know what, you believe, oh, it's okay, whatever you want, just believe in something. That makes everybody comfortable. God says, no. There's only one living and true God. Not many. Just one. And the Egyptians worshipped the Nile, so God turned it to blood to show his power and their false God's impotence. The Egyptians worshipped the sun, so God blacked out their sun God for three days to show who was really God. And people worship 
whatever God, and God says, nope, I'm the real one, and Jesus Christ is your only hope, and if you don't repent, you have no future but destruction. Secondly, both then and now, neither humans nor false gods can control nature. The Creator alone controls nature. And God, through the tribulation events, shows his omnipotence, that he is almighty, and we as humans are helpless. I mean, who can stop these events we're going to see at these trumpet blasts? Well, let's go through them. Number one, look at verse 7. This is what the text says. The first angel sounded. Remember, there were seven angels, and God is, is getting the prayers of the saints, puts them with the coals. He has them thrown to the earth in verses 5 and 6. The seven trumpeters, these angels that are always around him, step up to the edge in front of his throne, and the first one raises and blows the blast. That's what we see. The first angel sounded. Interesting. And hail and fire followed. So it's almost like as the sound waves are going from the trumpet, following them, John could see, following them were hail and fire mingled with blood. And they were thrown to the earth. So the, the, the kind of the scene John sees is this heavenly throne and glass of sea and all those countless angels kind of like sitting up in space overlooking the earth. And so they blow the trumpets toward the earth and following the trumpet comes this hail and fire and blood. And look what it does. And a third of the trees were burned and all green grass was burned up. Now all the way through these trumpets you're going to notice this fractional. Now I want you to think of something. Fractions in Revelation are a picture to us, a reminder. Now they're, they're real. God really only does a third. Why? Why is he doing that? It's a picture of God's mercy and his invitation to repentance. The meaning is the trumpet judgments are not to completely devastate. He isn't trying to, to, I mean, he could have killed everyone at once. That's what he does in the rebellion in Revelation 20. Not a shot is fired. He just says, enough is enough. And it's, here he doesn't do that. Why? Because he wants to show his mercy and give an invitation. These trumpets destroy only part of the vegetation on which we depend for our sustenance. But God sends a warning and a wake-up call. Now, now, for a minute, just think of what is going on here. The land areas of the earth total 30% of the surface. And so a third of this 30%, uh, 58 million square miles, a third of the 50, so 20 million square miles burn. Now, we don't have much concept of that. I mean, we've been watching, right, Yellowstone Fire on television. We're watching the floods in Colorado on television. This past Father's Day, there was a good illustration of this. Most of us didn't pay attention because it didn't happen in America, but the rest of the world was watching Sumatra, you know, Indonesia. Sumatra has this problem during their hot summer, the jungles dry out and fires start. And a fire started in the rainforest, the jungles of Sumatra, and it got a little out of hand, and it got so big that from space, satellites started noticing that the whole island of Sumatra was covered with smoke, and the smoke began to go across the straits into Malaysia and finally settled in a big smudge over Singapore. On Father's Day in Singapore, one of the largest cities of the world, you could not see the skyscrapers. It was like total fog out. And everybody in this highly modern civilized country was wearing these masks and having trouble breathing. See, can you imagine that going on all over the world? As, as this one-third of the surface, uh, the forest and the grass with the fire plague, fires that catastrophically burn up crops, homes, wildlife, anything else in their path, and fires that only leave behind smoldering piles of ashes and these clouds of smudge, smog, smoke, fog. History records what happens. I mean, it's interesting if you look at this. It's happened in America on the Monongahela River or whatever it's called in, uh, in around Pittsburgh somewhere. There was a steel mill and there was an inversion in November where warm air was over cold air, but they didn't turn the steel mill off in the 20s and they just kept chugging that thing out until the entire Monongahela Valley filled where you couldn't even see in front of you. 
And people started dying right and left because you just can't breathe smoke without oxygen. Now, there's a really interesting one that happened in London in 1952. It's called the Great Smog of London, December 5 through 9, 52. A period of cold weather combined with windless conditions collected airborne pollutants mostly from the use of coal, historians say, making a thick layer of smog over the city. It lasted five days and was so thick that they said you couldn't see further than three feet in front of you anywhere in the city of London. It says people shuffled along and felt for the bump of curbs and all motor cars and all trains were stopped so no one would get run over for five days. But, you know, it, it even went indoors, it says. They had to cancel all public meetings. People stayed in their house with stuff under their doors because this smoke was coming in through every space it could, filling indoor spaces. Well, everyone thought it was kind of cute for a while. But finally, when people started dying over the five days and the British hospital system said that 12,000 people died of respiratory ailments during that period and in the few weeks that followed. And over 100,000 were hospitalized in one little city event that blew away after five days. God sends this across the planet and a trumpet blast is the first warning from the Almighty God to his creatures, as Romans 1.25 says, who have exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worship the creator, or worship the creature instead of the creator. And what a warning, what a wake up from a just God who is also a savior. His arms of love are open. And they're open wide. And we know that many respond because in Revelation 6 and 7, there are these countless multitudes that come up out of the tribulation. Well, the second trumpet doesn't get any better. They each actually get worse if you look at the magnitude. The second angel blows his trumpet. Something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. What is it? It's something like a great mountain burning with fire that's thrown into the sea. I mean, we can speculate, but what's interesting is that is exactly what an asteroid would look like coming into the earth. It would look like a mountain and coming through the atmosphere it would be burning with fire only this one hits the sea and look, look what happens and a third, there's one of those fractions of the sea became blood and a third of the living creatures in the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed we can go backward, Jane's naval, you know Jane's fighting that does all the military stuff, in 2013 they say there's 177,000 registered, more than 100 gross weight tonnage vessels in the world 177,000 Above that, there are 12,000 warships of all nations and flags. 166 nations have warships. So that's 189,000. Let's just say it's 200,000. 60-some thousand ships through tsunamis, through whatever, are just wiped off the planet. You know what that tells me? Don't go on cruises. You know, go on a mission trip on land, you know, but not really. But, because this is not the tribulation. But, a third of the ships are gone. Can you imagine what's going to happen? All those iPhones being shipped from Shanghai don't get to us, you know, and everything else. It's going to be really bad. But it doesn't, then it says, a third of the living creatures in the sea died. Well, we feel pretty safe. We're on the land. The problem is the oceans cover how much of the surface? Over 70%. The most numerous plant creature is called phytoplankton. Phyto means plant, plankton means wanderer. It's a wandering plant that floats in 71% of the surface of the earth in the water. And those little factories make, depending on who you read, 55 to 85% of all the air. And a third of them die instantly. It, not only the whales, not only everything else, you know, the porpoises and everything else, but the plankton and the algae, and the brown, and the red, all of them, a third die. Now, we already have the smudge and the smoke coming in like it did in London in the houses. Now, the factories that were going to suck in that CO2 and blow out fresh air are dying. This is amazing what happens. Plus, he says that a third of the sea comes like blood. And so this, this whole fetid stench of death, a lifeless pallor on the water that were formerly teeming with life, what horrors as the God of the universe steps forward and through this plague says, I'm the God, 
that made everything. I'm the only one that keeps you alive. Are you going to repent? Are you going to turn to me? So many lay gasping for air like fish out of the water, and they find God as a Savior, and many respond. And the multitude saved out of this mess show that God heeds the call that they call upon him. Well, there's the facts. You can read it yourself in the encyclopedia. Third trumpet, okay? Now they're getting worse. Trumpet number three, an angel sounded, and a great star, Asterez, fell from heaven, burning like a lampress. Now, these words are all historic words. They're Greek words that are in literature outside the Bible, and it's interesting that the, the Asteres, I told you last week, asteroid, asteroids come from that, was anything that was lit in the sky at night other than the moon and the sun setting. Everything else was an asteres. So this is an asteres, but it says it's burning like a lampress. Now that word is all the way through Roman and Greek literature because they were very superstitious of comets and meteorites. And emperors always felt like it was an omen or something. Lampras, 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 Lampras. So we know that word is for either a meteorite or a comet. So this thing is probably defined by that Greek word as some type of a glowing spot in the sky that people see coming, and probably our telescopes will still be working, and they'll say, hmm, it's on a you know, collision course with the earth. Uh, you know, here it comes. But it comes, and God names it wormwood, uh, which is a kind of a bitter, poisonous substance. And look what it does. A third of the waters become wormwood. Now, we're talking not about the ocean. We've already hit those. 97% of the water on the planet is in the ocean. 3% is not in the ocean, and it's drinkable. It's the groundwater, the river water, the lake water. That's what this targets. And a third of the waters became wormwood. And look at this. Many men died from the water because it was made bitter. Nearly, nearly every form of life on earth is water dependent. Most living things are water-based. We are especially so, a huge percentage of our body. Again, 55 to 70 or a higher percent of us is water. We are water-dependent. Without water, life withers, dries up, crumbles, and returns to dust. And now the rivers are all running with deadly poison. It's not just the unfortunate people downriver from the factories in China. Every river runs with deadly poison. The wells, I mean, all the people that have their, their retreat and their well, those become springs of death. The lakes, the reservoirs are filled with toxic waters. People survive for a time the destruction of the food supply caused by the first two trumpets, but living off stored provisions ends when you don't have water. Water is so important. And to an already water-impoverished planet, this trumpet is catastrophic. God sends either a comet or a meteorite or an asteroid, and this blazing object poisons a third of all fresh water, and so desperate is humanity and so deadly is the poison that God says many die. So what happens? Well, as many lay dying in a dehydration stupor, they cry out for God as their Savior and he mercifully responds to their faith. God the Savior. We're going to meet people in heaven who were dying of poison water that come up to meet us. Well, let's go to trumpet four. And that is repent. God is the only source of light. Almost everything we know is somehow tied to light. So look what the Lord does. The fourth angel, verse 12, sounds... This is fascinating. A third of the sun was struck. Now, we understand that. The Soviets have just, or the Russians, have just published a, their monumental study of core samples in Siberia, and they found a 250-year cycle of the sun, and it's 250 years, actually, and 90 years and 11 years. And we know about all those, but they've really articulated it going all the way back into the 17th century. And what they say is there's these 250-year intervals of hot, and then an, a mini ice age. And they say that's what we're going into now. And this winter is supposed to be really a doozy. So we know that. A third of the sun is struck. There's a solar cycle and the luminosity increases and de decreases. And of course the reflector, the third of the moon, and a third of the stars. So a third of them were darkened. But look at this next line. A third of the day did not shine. 
You know, I keep my eye on it. There's a little light over here. Yeah, it's off again. It goes on and off and on and off, you know, and if you're sitting under it, all of a sudden you can see the words in your Bible, then you can't, then you can see the words in your Bible, then you can't. That's cute. It's a light. We're only in here an hour or so now and then. How would you like for one-third of the daytime? The sun goes out. You go, oh, is it going to come back on? Can you imagine what it's going to do to everything when all of a sudden there's no light? That's what it says. A third of the day did not shine. Likewise, the night, which shows that the moon is reflective of the sun, and if it goes out, this side is, is not having light, and that side is not having moonlight. Amazing. Almost everything we know is somehow tied to light, from photosynthesis to all meteorology to hydrology to the energy transfer to our earth. All are tied to the sun's light. Our atmosphere is warm. The great engines of weather are powered by, in part by the sun. So God says, if you refuse me as the creator and giver of light, I'll show you. I'll send darkness. Just think of the violent storms as this fourth trumpet precipitates. The earth cools, storms brew, weather convulses, earth slips into a twilight zone. God has already scorched the earth's food chains, leading to scarcity. The atmosphere is smoky. The, the trumpet two's dead seas make oxygen not be replaced. Trumpet three's poison-filled space invader pollutes the waters with death. God says, you refuse me, you'll find earth is nothing apart from its creator and sustainer. Life becomes for the world like being chained to a sinking ship or strapped in your seatbelt on a crashing airplane. And in that moment, multitudes of people look up and see God as Savior. But those who don't, look at verse 13, and this is the ending. Finally, God designed the final trumpet judgments. The last three, Lord willing, next week. Give humans, any that weren't convinced of God's power, hitting the ecology. God says, you guys have loved all those science fiction monster movies and you've loved all the occult and horror movies. How about if I make Earth one big horror movie? And I'm going to let out of the pit the monsters that are so bad, I've never let them interact with humans. And I'm going to let them out. And God gives humans a taste of hell. And it's so bad, verse 13 says, and it's all in chapter 9, I looked and I heard the angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three angels. They're still poised there. They're getting ready to raise one by one their trumpets. And as they do, the pit opens. And the horrific creatures began directly. Before, death has been secondary. Now, it's a direct frontal attack on humans. And by the way, no superheroes fly in on their airplane, you know, to save the planet. And there's no advanced civilization out there that will be able to share a life-extending technology with us humans. All of a sudden, the earth realizes it's just God, the Almighty, and us, his servants, and the devil, and his mutated, fallen angel rebels. That's all there is. And finally, earth dwellers get confronted with the real king, the Almighty God, the just, and the Savior. Changelessly balanced, loving, and just. And finally, everybody gets to decide have you repented while you can repent? You know, it says in Hebrews, while you hear his voice, harden not your heart. You know, just this past week I was um, speaking at Gull Lake and they told me that I was speaking at an adult retreat. And I thought, that's great. And I thought it was just a whole bunch of godly Christians that wanted a Bible conference. And so I prepared that way. And the first lesson was the seven doctrines of salvation. After that lesson, a dear 84 or 5-year-old man came up to me and said, he was wearing his hearing aids and he was going like this and he said, he was trying to be polite, and he said, I'm not sure I heard you correctly, so I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. He says, I have been for 85 years a practicing Roman Catholic. I have never missed Mass. I have never missed. I have never. And he went through everything he's done, and I gave to the holy this and that and that. And he said, and you 
I thought, and he went back to being polite, he said, I thought I heard you say that I was not going to heaven because of all those things. And he said, I would like you to clarify that. I said, okay. What you heard me say is what God says. And if you don't repent, no matter how many candles you've burned and rosaries you have said, no matter how many saints you've cried out to, if you don't repent as a hopelessly lost sinner and receive the gospel, you will not have eternal life. He said, I thought that's what you said. And that is what God says. And that's the loving and just God of Revelation 8. Let's bow. Father in heaven, I thank you for the miracle of the gospel. I thank you for the blessing that you are God, our Savior. And I thank you that you right now have your arms open wide to this world, but so few are hearing your voice they're trying to work their way to heaven their own way. They're, they're trying to cobble together their own ladder. And they don't realize that we all, in all of our efforts, fall short of your glory. And that only through a perfect substitute who lived the perfect life and died the perfect death, which is the promised Christ, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, only through him do we have life. And I pray for anyone here that has never personally embraced you, that like my friend this week, they'd realize that is what you say, that church and baptism and, and dedication and anything else doesn't get us to heaven. Only faith in you, O oh Christ, alone. And I pray that you would do a great work in all of our midst, that we would entrust you to guide control and keep our lives until you come or call and we ask for that in the precious name of jesus and for his glory we pray and all god's people said amen god bless you as you go